Sometimes the youngsters say, we don't know business. Where do we start? How does a person increase their wealth? They want to drop ship. People want to trade when it comes to coins and cryptocurrencies. So again, Forex trading, it, there is no clash between being affluent and being religious. Why does something become haram? Generally, it's because there's one of four things in it. If somebody has haram money, what do they do? And this wealth is a test for us. And we don't own it literally. Remember that this wealth is also a fitna from Allah Jalla wa ala. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes dua for those who are in business. But you have got to be somebody who is a visionary who uses their wealth such that it benefits you, your family, your community and the generations that come after. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam If somebody had to ask you as a Muslim Is Islam a complete religion? You find that every single one of us we would immediately say that yes, Islam is a complete religion. And most of us would go on to quote the verse from Surah Al-Ma'idah, wherein Allah Jalla wa Ala says, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Today, and this day was referring to the day of Arafah, in Hajjatul Wada' Allah Jalla wa Ala tells the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the address is for all of us. Today, I have completed your deen for you. Yes, we use this verse when speaking about people who want to add extra innovations in the religion. Yes, correct. However, this verse also means that if Islam is a complete religion, every single contemporary mas'ala that we see today, there is an answer for it. There is halal and haram involved. So for example, you find some of the youngsters they want to drop ship. Is they a ruling when it comes to drop shipping in Islam? We believe it's a complete religion. So surely there's got to be a ruling in terms of halal and haram. People want to trade when it comes to coins and cryptocurrencies. Does Islam have an answer for it? Yes, because it's a complete religion. Because we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have left some guidance for us. Inshallah, today we want to speak about rizq. Before getting into the topic, there's two important principles that we need to establish. The first is, as a Muslim, how do we look at wealth? You find that there are those out there where wealth has become the goal in life. So somebody wants to earn a million. Why do they want to earn a million? Maybe they want to show off to others. Maybe it's just to put it on Instagram. Maybe it's just for some sort of worldly benefit only. You find here when you look at these people, the goal is wealth and wealth alone. In Islam, we are not taught to look at wealth like that. Rather, we are taught to look at wealth as a wasila. What does wasila mean? Wasila means it is a means. A means of what? A means of doing good, attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the first principle that we've got to establish and agree on. In Islam, this wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, it's only been given to you for a little while. The money you earned now was with somebody else a few moments ago. Maybe you're working a job, maybe you sold a product, maybe you did a service for somebody and they paid you. That money was with them just a few moments ago. It's now being transferred into your ownership and you will use it or you may die with it in your ownership. What happens after that? If you die with that wealth, it's then distributed. What am I trying to get at? We're trying to get at the point that this wealth is the wealth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever you have of it, you've been entrusted with it to see how will you use it. Will you use it in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or will you use it in a way that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So when we understand that this wealth is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this wealth is a test for us and we don't own it literally. It's going to go to others. We understand the importance of spending and we understand the importance of using it in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we said the first thing we need to establish is that 
This wealth is a means of doing good and this wealth you've been entrusted with it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you about it. Then you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us all with basic needs. In Surah Taha, Allah jalla wa ala, towards the end, he makes mention of four essential needs that every single human being needs. Anybody knows the verse? In Surah Taha, towards the end. Anybody? Allah jalla wa ala. Fi ayatani shaykh. Allah jalla wa ala, addressing Adam alayhi salam, when he's told to enter into Jannah, what does he tell him? He says, in this Jannah that you are in, inna laka alla taju'a fiha wa la ta'ra, wa annaka la tazma'u fiha wa la tadha. In this Jannah that you are in, you will never be hungry. Inna laka alla taju'a fiha, ju'a from hunger. And you will never be unclothed, you'll always have something to cover you. And you will not be somebody or you will not be those who are thirsty. That drink will be provided for you. And wala ta'ra, you will not be exposed to the elements, you'll have some sort of shelter. When you look at this verse in just four words, Allah Jalla wa ala summarizes the basic necessities for every single human being. That's why when you look at those who gather money for charity generally, it's within these four. They're either gathering money for those who need to eat and drink so people don't have food and drink or they don't have clothes or they don't have shelter. Allah Jalla wa ala, in this verse, these two verses, he puts all these basic essentials in one place. Why am I touching on this? Because... Once we agree that every human being needs these certain basics, what's extra? More than that, a person wants to go out and earn even more, a million, a billion, whatever it may be. Are they allowed to do that or not? So here you find the people are divided into two categories. The first is those who their essentials are in order. They are not a burden on everybody else or Maybe they're young, their parents support them, or they're supported by the state. And they say that our essentials are in order, we don't want anything extra, we are content. That's permissible. And you find an example in some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, as recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari, he was asked by some of the Sahaba. He said, why is it that you narrate a hadith that we don't hear others narrating? What did he say? He said, when I came to Medina, I had nothing in terms of material wealth. And the muhajirun and the ansar, they were busy. Some of them got busy with their livelihoods and their businesses, etc. When they were absent, Abu Huraira was present with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Hence, he memorized. He was happy with the little that he had. And that's permissible. Then you find that the second category, those who want more, and bearing in mind what we mentioned, that this wealth is a means of doing good. Those who want more, is it permissible? Is it permissible to go out and get that car, which is the latest car, or a large house, etc.? It's permissible. And there were Sahaba radiallahu anhum who did this, who were extremely wealthy. That's why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself, he bought and sold. We always speak about how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the example and the masterpiece and sent as Rahma Lil Alameen. He is Qudwa, the one whom we follow. So yes, we understand in his ibadah as well as his character and conduct. But for his message to be complete, Allah Jalla wa Ala decided that he also had to buy and sell so we can see. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari, when wanting to buy the camel of Jabir radiallahu anhu, he starts asking him about his condition. He then asks him about the camel. He then agrees a price with him. Before agreeing, he is negotiating with Jabir radiallahu anhu. All these points in the hadith, the ulama mention that this, these, the, these are all business etiquettes. A person learns how to negotiate. A person learns how to name their price. A person learns how to buy. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself sold. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself helped one of the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum to auction some of their products. That's why it's mentioned that he said, Man Yazid, who'll increase, i.e. there was an auction and there was a bid. 
Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu, the best person after the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Anbiya, the best person from this ummah after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know of his acts of worship, we know of his ibadat, we know of his sacrifice, but he himself was a businessman. He himself had wealth. When it came to hijrah, he tells the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, don't worry, I will organize everything in terms of our camels, the food, etc. And that's why when it was time to give sadaqah, Umar radiallahu anhu says, there came a day where I thought I would surpass Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam asks, who is going to give wealth? And notice how Umar radiallahu anhu also had wealth. That's why it's recorded again in, in Sahih al-Bukhari that when the Muhajirun came to Medina and they were with the Ansar, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam paid them together. Umar radiallahu anhu and his uh, companion, the one who he was paid with, they would take days. So one day Umar radiallahu anhu would go to learn from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst this one was doing business. And one day he would manage the business and the other would go to learn and whatever he missed in terms of knowledge, he would ask the other. So people of business, people of wealth. So the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks, there was a time where he asks for the people to give. And Umar radiallahu anhu says, today I will surpass Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So he comes with half his wealth and he leaves it with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, asks him, what have you left for your family? He says, I've left half my wealth and half I've given it. And then he asks Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He says, what have you given? He says, here I've given all my wealth. What have you left for your family? I've left Allah and his messenger. It's enough. He was a person who had wealth. And some of the scholars mention when speaking about this ruling, they say, is it permissible for somebody to give all their wealth in charity? They say if their iman was like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and if they had a business where they had recurring revenue, revenue carries on coming in, then it's permissible. But notice how they also had wealth. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, he, you know, before I came, I was actually counting how many times was he given glad tidings for Jannah? Many different occasions. Many different occasions. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu is promised Jannah. And when it comes to his wealth, what's authentically recorded, I managed to find three. First is when it comes to the well. When the Muslimun came to Medina, there was no water. The water or the well was owned by somebody who was charging exorbitant amounts. He didn't want to give the Muslims water. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Whoever buys this well, he will have Jannah. Imagine, what we all strive for is Jannah. And one day the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam says that whoever is able to do this act of worship or this action or buy this thing, he will be given Jannah. Surely everybody wants to do it. But only the one who had wealth at the time was able to do it. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He buys the well and he's promised Jannah. On another occasion, the campaign of Tabuk, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam asks, who will prepare this army? And Uthman radiallahu anhu is the one who prepares the army and he is promised Jannah. Everybody would want to do that, but they didn't have wealth. The third occasion, the masjid, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam wanted to increase it. They wanted to expand it. And he says, whoever gives for this masjid, whoever is able to build this masjid and expand it will be given a house in Jannah and Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu is the one who builds the masjid. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, we know of his ibadat, we know of his acts of worship, we now know about his wealth. He was the one who in one unit of prayer, one raka'ah, he recited the whole Quran, the whole Quran. If you had to count, a person who reads quickly, how fast do you read one juz in? 30 minutes? 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Let's say 20 minutes. In one hour, that's three juz. In 10 hours, that's 30 juz. So you're talking about one of the richest at his time. Yet he had Qiyamul Layl and it's recorded that he 
in one raka'ah, so roughly between 8 and 12 hours, he managed to finish the Qur'an. What does this teach us? That for the person who has the correct intention, and for the person who wants goodness, there is no clash between being affluent and being religious. A person is able to give their uh, sadaqat, a person is able to perform their salah, a person is able to help others while still maintaining a business, while still being wealthy. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, again, in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's recorded that when he wanted to get married, he tells one of the companions from the Ansar, he says, let's take my camel and we'll go to a nearby village. And we load idhkhir. Idhkhir is a type of grass. This is who? Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. What does he want to do? He wants to get married. He says, let us go there. We will load my animal with this grass and we'll come back to Medina and sell it. What does this show us? That even those who, even those who claim to be knowledgeable or those who have knowledge or those who feel that I can only seek knowledge and I have to leave all my basics. I I don't have to look at them. No, that's not true. There is no clash between the two. There should be a balance between the two. Also, for those youngsters out there, your role models. You know, we we read today about entrepreneurs and those who became millionaires and billionaires. Look, Look at the... Uh, the hadith and look at the sahaba radiallahu anhum and look at the tabi'un you'll find so many stories of those who are business people those who are smart at business and you will learn from them and you will also learn from their good character and conduct and how they were able to use their wealth so Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu he goes he gets this idhkhir and he comes to Medina to sell it Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu again paired with Sa'd ibn Rabi' from the Ansar Sa'ad ibn Rabi' tells Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he says that whatever I have, I am one of the wealthiest from the Ansar, whatever I have, I will give you half my business, my wealth, anything that I have. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf says no. He says, show me where the marketplace is. This is who? A sahabi from the ten who were promised Jannah. He was also a businessman. He says, show me where the marketplace is. And he went and after a short period of time, he became one of the wealthiest people in Medina. He became one of the wealthiest people in Medina. Who was he? A sahabi promised Jannah. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressing one of the sahaba, telling him it's instead of asking and asking and asking, it's better for you to get an axe and go and chop wood instead of asking the people for wealth. What does this show us? That wherever you may be in life, try to be somebody who is not dependent on others. Try to be somebody who works even if it may be, even if you're earning a little bit, but at least you don't have to ask others. Also, when you look at these ahadith and you study, look at Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu. He asks Sa'ad ibn Rabi' To show him where the marketplace is. Sometimes the youngsters say, we don't know business. Where do we start? Go to those who are selling. Just go and see how they are doing it and you will learn. Maybe you don't have capital, you don't have wealth. Look at how the Messenger ﷺ tells the Sahabi, it's better for you to chop wood, i.e. It's better for you to give your services to others and charge for them so you're able to eat instead of begging, instead of asking others. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, in the Quran, Allah Jalla wa'ala makes mention of different ahkam regarding buying and selling. Allah Jalla wa'ala, in fact in Surah Al-Baqarah, the longest verse in the Quran is in the Surah. What's it speaking about? It's speaking about money. It's speaking about debt. It's speaking about writing down what you owe and what you are owed. When it came to inheritance and dividing money, Allah Jalla wa'ala is the one who he himself from above the seven heavens, he decreed who gets what. That's why we know the ayat of inheritance mentioned in Surah An-Nisa. Dawood alayhi salam, a nabi of Allah Jalla wa'ala. We know that he lived many years. And Allah Jalla wa'ala mentions different parts of his story in the Quran. In Surah Sad, he mentions a story regarding finance, regarding partnership, 
and regarding or giving us advice. Anybody who wants to go into partnership, there is advice for you in Surah Sad. What does this show us? The fact that Allah Jalla wa ala is mentioning it, it shows how important it is. Dawood alayhi salam was in his place of ibadah, an act of worship. And two people jump over into where he is. They jump over the wall. And one of them has a problem. He's complaining about his brother. Who were these people? The Mufassirin differ. There's a lot that's been mentioned. Were they angels? Were they people? According to the verses of the Quran, these were two people who had an argument, who had a problem regarding who is owed or who owns what. One claimed to have 99 sheep and he says, my brother who has the 99, he also wants my one, i.e. he wants to make it 100. And Allah Jalla wa ala, uh, tells Dawood alayhi salam. In fact, Dawood alayhi salam judges without listening to the other side of the story. So Allah Jalla wa ala reprimands him. And then Allah says, وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضِ Most people who are partners, in partnership, they oppress one another, they wrong one another. وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except those who believe. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ They do good deeds. وَقَلِيلٌ مَا هُمْ And you should know that these people are very few. You want to go into partnership. You want to borrow money from somebody. You want to get into business. There's a lot of advice and a lot of guidelines that have been given to you. So study the Quran and go through the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today's topic, or one of the points mentioned in the topic was how to increase risk. How does a person increase their wealth? Firstly, understand and follow the guidelines that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Then there are those things which are specific. Firstly, make dua. Ask Allah Jalla wa ala to grant you an abundance in rizq and ask him to make you from those people who have barakah in their wealth so they are able to spend it in a way that pleases Allah Jalla wa ala. Yesterday was the day of Ashura. We all heard the story of Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam in Surah Al-Qasas, Allah Jalla wa ala mentions that when he fled for his life and he was in Madian and he helped the two girls who wanted to make their animals drink. After helping them, what does he do? He's got nothing. He's just fled for his life. There are people who want his head. As he's resting, he makes dua to Allah Jalla wa ala. He says, Rabbi, inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. Oh my Lord, whatever goodness you send my way, I am in need of it. He had nothing. What did he get? He got married. He was looked after. The pious man told him, La takhaf, don't fear, don't worry. After that, he's given prophethood. And after that, Allah Jalla wa ala sends him to Fir'aun with the message. Wherever you may be, Allah Jalla wa ala knows your condition. That's why he says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call out to me and I will respond to you. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my worshippers ask about me, ask of me, I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ I respond to the one who calls out to me. So the first is make dua and ask Allah Jalla wa ala to grant you. The second is make a lot of istighfar. Ask Allah to forgive your sins, clean your heart and clean your slate. Nuh alayhi salam tells his people, telling Allah Jalla wa ala how they've disbelieved. And he says, I told them, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ Seek forgiveness from Allah Jalla wa ala, إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا He forgives all sins. Not only will he forgive your sins, يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا He will send rain down from the heavens, وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And he'll give you an abundance in wealth and children. So istighfar, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is a reason bi idhnillah for a person's wealth to be secured and increase. The third is salah. Allah Jalla wa ala addressing the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He tells him, don't look at what we've given others in terms of the dunya. وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Then he says, what should you rather do? وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاهِ Order your family. And the order is for you also to perform salah wastabir alayha and be patient with the salah. Sometimes it's difficult, especially here where the days are long. You've got Maghrib, Isha, Fajr, and then the day carries on again. Allah says, wastabir alayha. Be patient with the salah. It's cold and it's winter. You need to make wudu. Be patient with it. Then Allah says, 
وأمر أهلك بالصلاة واستبر عليها لا نسألك رزقا نحن نرزقك Tell them we don't ask you for wealth We are the ones who will sustain you Look at how in this ayah Allah Jalla wa Ala is mentioning salah along with wealth So be from those who perform their salah and perform their salah in the best of manner Another point, I think this is the third or the fourth The fourth is to give out your charity and that includes your compulsory charity as well as your voluntary charity. A lot of times we don't realize that things go wrong in our life because we haven't given out our zakah, that which is compulsory upon you. It actually belongs to somebody else. It doesn't belong to you. You haven't given it out. And also we are encouraged to give that which is voluntary. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith that every morning two angels make dua and they say, Oh Allah, give the one, grant the one who gives, give him goodness, grant him an increase. And as for the one who holds back, who doesn't want to spend, don't grant him, grant him talaf. Talaf is from destruction, that which he doesn't have. Also a person should have tawakkul. Allah jalla wa ala says, وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ have full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that he will grant you when you have true tawakkul. True tawakkul doesn't mean sitting at home and doing nothing. Nor does true tawakkul mean being attached to the means. No, it's in between. You are attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You put your trust in him and you do that which you are able to do. Allah jalla wa ala is the one who grants. Also having taqwa. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has taqwa of Allah Jalla wa Ala, He will make an escape, a route for him, وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And Allah Jalla wa Ala will grant him rizq and sustenance from ways that he cannot even imagine. The seventh point when it comes to increasing rizq is to maintain your family ties. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informs us in a hadith that if a person wants an increase in wealth and in his life, he should be somebody who maintains family ties. He should be somebody who maintains family ties. And today, with technology, it's extremely easy. You message somebody, you call somebody, they far away, you ask about them, your family. Allah Jalla wa ala has promised a reward for that. A person may say when it comes to giving sadaqah, I don't have anything. I want you to ponder over one hadith. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs us that a person was promised Jannah. A person was promised Jannah. For doing what? For moving an obstacle from the road. What did he do? Yes, we know the deed. He, there was an obstacle, there was a branch and he moved it away. If you had to ponder over that, also, if you ponder over the hadith where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam says a woman was given Jannah who was in sin. She was drowning in sin. She did a good deed by feeding the dog, quenching the thirst of the dog and she was promised Jannah. Ponder over this act of worship. What is it? What is it? It's a person who is doing good for others and it may even be an animal. You are giving sadaqah. Sadaqah is not only monetarily. It's also helping others. It's also helping animals. That's why in another hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam informs one of the sahaba. He says that, try, to, try your best to give sadaqah. And he says, you know, if I can't, or Messenger of Allah, he says, try to help somebody. He says, and if I can't, he says, holding your evil away from others, meaning don't do anything, but don't harm somebody else, is sadaqah. It's charity in its own way. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, staying away from haram and staying away from sin, bi'ithnillah, secures your, your wealth. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa informs us that a person may be prevented from some wealth that is going to come to him. Why? Because he's committed a sin. And if you look in the sharia, you find that when speaking about business and buying and selling, Allah says, وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ Business, buying and selling has been made permissible. So the default ruling in business, buying and selling is everything is halal until proven otherwise. 
Why does something become impermissible? Why does something become haram? Generally, it's because there's one of four things in it. The first is, there's interest involved. That's why Allah says, وَحَرَّمَ riba. He made interest impermissible and haram. The second is, if there's some sort of jahala or gharar, there's a very big unknown. Something that if you put a dollar, you may get a million. Or if you put a hundred dollars, you may lose everything. For example, gambling. That's why it's impermissible. Because there's that harm and jahala. Number three is, if there is some sort of harm to you or to other people. Barar. That's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informs us that najash, najash is when people are bidding for something. So you find somebody who wants to buy a building. And there's somebody else who just wants to increase in price. He has no intention of buying. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that if he carries on bidding more and he's got no intention to buy, then that is impermissible. Why is it impermissible? Because there's darar. There's some sort of harm. So that's point number three. And point number four is, at times something may seem to be permissible. However, it leads you to haram. Hence, it's also prohibited or impermissible. So extremely easy. Allah Jalla wa ala has made everything halal for you until proven otherwise. The default ruling in Kitab al is everything is permissible until, one of, uh, until proven otherwise. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, the last point I want to touch on, the last point I want to mention is when looking at wealth, yes, it's good to have wealth, people enjoy, people go out, etc. As long as it's permissible, no problem. But you have got to be somebody who is a visionary, who uses their wealth such that it benefits you, your family, your community and the generations that come after. This was the practice of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the practice of the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum. When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to Medina, what's one of the first things he did? He established Masjid Quba. Then he goes to Bani Najjar, or Banu Najjar, a tribe in Medina. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants to establish his masjid, which we know today as Masjid Al-Nabawi. What does he tell them? There's no masjid there. He says, Thaminuni. He's identified the plot that he wants to take. Then he says, name your price, O Banu Najjar. Why? Think of it. When you have a masjid, the community is able to gather. People are able to fulfill their ibadat, one of the main acts of worship, which is salah. It also keeps the brotherhood. It keeps everything together. Look at how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needed to buy this piece of land in order to establish the masjid. When he came to Medina, there was no water, a resource, something that people need. What does he do? He says, whoever buys the well, he will get Jannah. What is this? This is thinking on behalf of the community. The community needs water. How are we going to get water? We need somebody to buy the well. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Muslims came to Medina, there was a marketplace. I give you an example similar to when you've got a market or a mall. People need to pay in order to sell in there. So the person who owned the marketplace, he was charging exorbitant amounts. What does the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? He knows that the Muslims need a place to buy and sell. So he buys a piece of land and he makes it waqf and he tells them, هَذَا سُوقُكُمْ This is your marketplace, O Muslim. You are able to buy and sell freely without these exorbitant charges and exorbitant amounts. What's this? This is vision. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established protected areas, what they know as hima. Why? The camels from sadaqah. You know, when, when a person gives sadaqah, Either you give your sadaqah here, we're talking about compulsory sadaqah, zakah. Zakah in the Quran at times is also referred to sadaqah. When a person gives zakah, compulsory charity, either they are giving wealth or if they are farming, they are giving crop or if they have animals, certain conditions are met, they give those animals. In order to keep the camels and the cows, if there were any, as well as the goats, they've got to stay somewhere. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam establishes this, these pieces of land specifically for those animals. What's that? That's vision. And that's needing to use wealth in order to do that. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, through his khilafah, you find there were strategic decisions 
that he took when it came to wealth. Umar radiallahu anhu ruled for a much longer time. Some of the some of the authors, some of the scholars, they mentioned that at his time they had a D1. What was the D1? D1 is where everybody's names were written. So when wealth used to come, we know the people of Badr, those who were still alive. We know the Muhajirun. We know the Ansar. Let's give so and so. These people are in need. Umar radiallahu anhu so much so. When the Muslim empire spread and there was land that was under the empire, he didn't want to give it out to those who were alive because they already had. Why? He mentions one of his reasons. He says, what will remain for the Muslim generations who are going to come in the future? That's vision. And it's also a monetary as well as economic decision. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, at his time, we know about his ibadah, we know about his wealth. Look at his forward thinking. In his reign, it was the first time where the Muslims had what we could call today a navy, where they had ships in order to sail, and they sailed in the Mediterranean and went towards Cyprus. That happened when? Time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, the point I'm trying to get at is, there is no disconnect when it comes to wealth in Islam and being a good Muslim. As we mentioned at the beginning, if you're somebody who's content with what you have, you're not a burden on everybody else, it's okay, it's fine. And if you're somebody who wants to go out and earn more, you want to make your thousands and millions and billions, go but go with the correct intention and be somebody who has that vision. In order for us to come here today to this masjid, surely there was a time where they had to buy the property. They had to buy the carpets. They had to buy the microphones. It comes from where? It doesn't just fall from the sky. This wealth, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, when we look at it from the correct lens, we are able to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are also able to earn Jannah. And a person also benefits in his lifetime. That's why, again in Sahih al-Bukhari, we all know the story of the three who were stuck in the cave. The first, for those who don't know, I'll, I'll mention it quickly, and then we want to touch on the third person. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressing the Sahaba, he says there was a group who came before, and they got into a cave. When they were in this cave, a boulder came and covered the entrance to that cave. They were unable to get out. So they all, speaking amongst themselves, they say that we've got to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from this affliction we are in. So the first person makes dua. He asks Allah jalla wa ala, he says, oh Allah, I had parents, I was obedient to them. And he speaks about uh, how he waited in order to give them milk. And the boulder moves a little bit, but not enough for them to get out. The second, he says how he was able to commit sin with one of his relatives. He was able to do it, but he left it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the boulder moves a little bit, but they're still unable to come out. The third person, what does he say? He says, oh Allah, I had somebody who was working for me and he left his wage. What's this? This is business. He left his wage. Some of the riwayat of the hadith say it was a few grains. Could be rice, could be wheat, whatever it may be. He left it with me and he went away. I took this wealth and I began to grow it. In our terms, I invested it. And this wealth grew and grew and grew and I was able to get cattle and camels and sheep, etc. And one day he came later on and he said, Ya Abdullah, O servant of Allah, give me that which is due to me. And he says, I told him, whatever wealth you see that's in front of you is all yours. Whatever wealth you see that's in front of you is all yours. And he says, oh Allah, he took every single thing and didn't leave anything for me. And he says, oh Allah, if I did this for your sake, help us in the affliction we are in. And the boulder moved and they were able to get out. What does this show you? This shows you that the one who employed others when he was honest and he was upright, he benefited in this dunya and bi'ithnillah there is a reward for him in the akhirah. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes dua for those who are in business. He says, Rahim Allahu abdan. May Allah have mercy on a servant who samhan idha ba'a. He is 
easy going kind hearted when he sells wa idha ishtara when he buys wa idha qtada and in another riwayah wa idha qada when he needs to pay he pays on time he pays properly and when he needs to collect money from others he's respectful and he he is kind towards them and in the same breath we've heard all about some of the benefits and those some of the benefits of wealth as well as those from the sahaba who are business people remember that this wealth is also a fitna from allah jalla wa ala that's why in the quran he says inma amwalukum wa auladukum fitna indeed this wealth and your children that you have are a trial and a test and a tribulation so always bear that in mind and be from those who follow the middle path when it comes to wealth with those few words we ask allah jalla wa ala to grant us all firstly beneficial knowledge and we ask him to make us from those who have good and halal wealth we ask him to grant us the ability to use wealth in a way that pleases him and at the same time i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and reward the brothers who put this event and program together and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all for having come here having uh, sat and for the uh, for the reason only to benefit from Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that's why it's mentioned in a hadith the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says there is no gathering where the people gather in order to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no ulterior motive no material that brings them together it's only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no gathering like that except that mercy descends upon them the angels surround them and at the end it said to them qumu maghfuran lakum depart and your sins have been forgiven and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most kind wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in if anybody's got any questions uh, whatever we whatever i know i'll answer whatever i don't know i'll leave the mashaikh now mashallah so the brother was asking uh, about coins cryptocurrencies uh, people when they talk about bitcoin ethereum etc and he said what is the shar'i ruling on it before giving any shar'i ruling when a person claims that this is the law of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's extremely dangerous what we can say is that from what's apparent for those who've studied and for those who've gone through it you find that you find that these coins have been around for a very long time and i always tell the brothers that before speaking in terms of fatwa or giving your opinion on it go and learn about how the technology works go and learn what's a blockchain go and learn what's a timestamp go and learn what is mining a lot of the times people who don't understand how a whatsapp message works they are the ones who say who are speaking about whether it's halal or haram no you've got to go and understand it it's not only a fiqhi masala there's also technology involved there's also uh money involved we've spoken about it before inshallah uh, i'll send you a link to that Uh, to summarize it as you all are probably used to when somebody comes and asks a question like that the scholars differ there are those who say it's impermissible and some of the reasons they mention is we don't know who made these coins especially when it comes to bitcoin who was uh, the founder of it is it a person is it a group of people etc then they say or they believe that the state are the only ones who can issue currency they say that the state are the only ones who can issue currency and they mention how the price may go up and down etc and they have a few other pieces of evidence those who say it is permissible they counter this by saying as for the coins themselves regardless of who made them some coins you know who made them this they are centralized cryptos and they are decentralized regardless of who made them they left us a white paper and they've left us rules and they've left us the algorithm etc hence we are able to see what exactly is going on as for the state only issuing currency then they have an opinion with regards to one of the madhahib in the hanafi madhhab there is a small allowance for if a person Uh, wants to deal with somebody else in a currency that they agree on regardless of the state then 
they allow it. So they use that also. And number three, when speaking about it fluctuating up and down, they say that there are currencies out there. So for example, I come from a country where we went through hyperinflation. You have one note written 100 million and 100 billion and 100 trillion. You can't even buy a loaf of bread. So they say that you cannot use that as a reason for it being haram. You cannot use it as a reason because if you say that's a reason for it being haram, you should say these are also impermissible and they allowed it. Now, the, the question or and any other fiqhi question that you ask somebody, when you find that there are two opinions, three opinions, four opinions, your job is to go to the most knowledgeable person that you know, the one who you can trust between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you take their opinion, and bearing in mind that uh, the country you're living in, as far as I know, uh, in this country, it's people trade and people uh, buy and sell these coins, uh, make sure you're on the right side of the law. If somebody has haram money, what do they do? So the first thing they should do is make tawbah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive their shortcomings. The second is, if they are still involved in a haram activity, they should now give that up. And number three is, any money that they may have made from before, so for example, interest, etc., person wants to repent, he makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and according to some of the scholars, he remains with that wealth because if you tell him to give all that wealth to charity, he's not going to make tawbah. So they say, no, he'll keep that wealth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. Bearing in mind that at times a person may get haram money from that which is not his. So if you stole from somebody else, it's not you make tawbah now and it's over. No, you go and give that wealth back. So there's huququllah the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as huququl ibad, the rights of the servants, and most of the scholars men mention that as for huququllah, rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when a person wants to repent, then this is built on uh, forgiveness and mercy. And as for the rights of others, it's generally built on uh, the human being by nature being stingy, hence expect them not to forgive. Now, that's it. the hadith about waking up in the morning. There's one hadith where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that بُورِكَ لِأُمَّتِي فِي بُكُورِهَا So there's barakah in the earliness of the day. As for a hadith about speak, uh, sleeping after fajr reduces your wealth, I don't know. Wallahu alam, I don't know. I, this first time I'm hearing from you and I'll go check. Um, nah. So again, forex trading, it depends how you're trading. Uh, those, those who go, uh, those who trade online, what they'll tell you is sometimes the lot, the allotment, is it 100,000, etc., it's too small. So what we're trading in, in terms of small money, a few hundred, few thousand, etc., they say there's a delay, hence it won't be impermissible, but it won't be permissible. But ask those who trade, it depends on the website you're using, it depends on the broker you're using, or are you just, you know, trading money at uh, the guy, I don't know if you have them, your sarraf, money exchanger, etc. There's people who trade like that. When the rate goes up, then they buy. And then when, uh, when the rate is down, they buy. And when it goes up again, then they sell to make a profit. So it depends how you're trading that Forex and where you're trading it. Are you just on one of the apps and uh, you've got a bank account where you trading this way and that way, or do you have positions that you have to open? Are they charging you for keeping those positions open uh, later on? So there's a lot of detail that goes into just answering whether it's yes or no. Yes. If you have haram money and you buy food, I see there's, uh, there was somebody asking me a similar, similar question related to this. If somebody goes for hajj without permission, is the hajj also not counted or is it counted? 
No, so there's a mas'ala, you go back in Usul al-Fiqh, where they speak about this mas'ala and they give an example of a person who has a stolen house, okay? Or a person, let's say, who's stolen this water. Somebody steals water and then they go to make wudu with this water. Is their salah counted or it's not? It's, no. So they say that if you're able to uh, differentiate between the two, you say this is separate, he will be sinful for the stealing. However, for him having made uh, performed salah, we're not going to tell him perform your salah again. And that is a majority opinion. So you look, are you able to separate these two or are you unable to? So similarly, that, that would come into play. Person came, he ate, he's doing something wrong, he's using somebody else's wealth, he should pay it back, it's impermissible. Whether he's sinful or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge. Meaning, if he's repented, and how does he repent? So let me ask you guys a question, since nobody wants to ask. In Islam, if somebody buys something, four, what's a high number you can think of? 100,000? A million? If somebody buys something for a million pounds, Islamically, are they allowed to sell it for two million pounds or not? If no, why? And if yes, why? If your answer is no, then why not? And if your answer is yes, then why yes? He's making how much profit? 100%. Am I right? Why? You guys always, uh, well, and I don't know about you, but a lot of the brothers, mashallah, who are practicing, and then when you say something, they say, well, where's your evidence? So I'm going to ask you, where's your evidence? <laughs> sure. But this person's making 100% profit. Is he allowed to do that? And if the buyer is not rich? If he's borrowing, let, let's say let's say he wants to buy it for two million and he's going to get money and he's able to pay that debt later on, he gets a thirty-year loan, no interest. Hmm? He wants to buy it. Can he do that? And the guy who's selling it, can he make that extra million or he can't? And what you would think? So where's your delete? <laughs> There's a hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari, where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sends Urwah al-Bariqi radiallahu anhu. He sends him with a dinar to go and buy a sheep. He says, a dinar is a gold coin. He says, take this dinar and go and buy a sheep. So Urwah radiallahu anhu, he comes back with the dinar and the sheep. How did he do it? When he went to the marketplace with that dinar, he managed to buy two sheep and then he sold one of them. So he got back the dinar and he went with the sheep. What's that? It's 100% profit. But as the brother mentioned that as long as you are not doing what's ihtikar, where you're holding a monopoly and you're just making it hard on the people. Let's say it's open business. Everybody's able to import, export, etc. Everybody's able to access those products. And why I mention that is... For those who buy and sell online, you might find something from abroad which is a dollar or two dollars and you're able to sell it here for fifty dollars. If that's the market price, everybody's able to get it, you're allowed to make that much profit. And if you find five or ten pounds on the floor, what do you do with it? Can you take it or you can't? Can you take it or you can't? You don't know the owner. Five pounds, only five. It's only five. The guy who's dropped it, you don't know who he is. Let's say somebody dropped it and the day has passed. You were going to school. You saw this five pounds and then, uh, shall I say, honest community. So the next, day, <laughs> the next day you came, you saw it again. You leave it there. What do you do with it? What if he wants to use it? These are all masail in buying and selling day to day. Day to day you see these things going on. I'll give you guys homework. Inshallah, go and look in, in Kitab al-Buyu. There's a chapter that speaks about luqatah. 
luqata so when somebody has lost something and then it's divided into how valuable it is or not inshallah you read on that and uh, next time when i come bi <laughs> you can give me the answer and i'll help you a little bit so it's according to uh, the value of what it is dep- then it depends what the person can do and the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked about a sheep and was asked about camels etc the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in some hadith it's mentioned that he was given a choice of being a nabi who was a king who had wealth and kingdom or just to be a normal slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who never have much and he chose to be the latter but what i also want you to remember is that the sahaba who were wealthy at the time also they were, they used their wealth to help the deen and that's why the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam towards the end of his life he says that we haven't benefited from anybody's wealth more than what we've benefited from the wealth of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu we are unable to pay him back his reward is with Allah his reward is with Allah and that's why when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam wanted some food he had to give his armor coat of armor as collateral with a non-muslim man and in case he was unable to pay he he passed away before that this man would be able to sell this coat of armor in order to retrieve the money and when the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away he he didn't leave much behind and whatever he left behind goes to sadaqa i'm not from england so we don't have those issues where we come from inshallah you ask somebody who's a local بارك الله فيكم انا you know to answer your question there was a time where we in zimbabwe went through hyperinflation there were notes i told you a million billion trillion 100 trillion etc the ulama who were in the country would understand and those who were not in the country couldn't understand so you find that if you gave me uh, 100000 zimbabwe dollars at the time and i could buy a house i could buy a house and then later on i want to give it back to you and i can and you can only buy a bottle of water okay so they are scholars from abroad but because they were not in that country and didn't live in that community they didn't understand so similarly i'm not from here and uh, these are masail you learn in the book as for fatwa uh, giving a ruling you ask those who are here inshallah who live here and who know the system jazakumullahu khairan uh, i think there's nobody else who's got anything to say Yes. Ashall I you do your homework and I'll come back <laughs> and you tell me the answer. I I I purposely left that open. Why? because we always hear about salah and zakah and those are extremely important most important your ibadat but a lot of the times we don't realize that our day to day things that we use mashallah you guys here you have delivery apps and this guy where you can jump in his car uber etc all these there's there's fiqhi rulings to them is it permissible is it not permissible if it is permissible which masala do you look at in the past that's mentioned in the quran and sunnah how do you relate them together and then derive a ruling So I purposely left that loop open so you guys can look at it inshallah. Jazakumullahu khairan. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah bless you all. And uh, again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those whom he is pleased with and gather us all into the highest paths of Jannah. Ameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.